Our guest today is a physician assistant that specializes in cosmetic and general dermatology. Please help me to introduce PA injector, Jennifer Adams. <laughs> I didn't ah. know. <laughs> Hello, call me yes. Jenny. Um, I, I let all my friends call me Jenny. Jennifer's like only when I'm in trouble, which never happens. So you can just call me Jenny. And I currently practice in cosmetic dermatology and my background is really all in plastic and reconstructive surgery. I do a little bit of medical derm, um, but really not too much at all. I just don't want to oversell myself on my regular derm. Um, and Jennifer's amazing. She's amazing, amazing. Where are you located right now? Tell everybody where you're located right now. Okay, I'm only gonna do that, Jonathan, if you promise to call me Jenny, not Jennifer. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I got you. You're my friend. We're friends. We go yes. right back. <laughs> uh, so I currently practice in San Diego, and I am from Georgia. My previous mm. practice was on the A. Thank you very much. So I was a Southern girl there and I'm a SoCal girl, a Southern California girl now. Nice, nice. How is the aesthetic industry in San Diego? Well, uh, it is actually, I mean, it's booming as people could imagine. I think that can be said kind of for anywhere. I definitely have noticed, I mean, I obviously work at a different subspecialty of a practice now. I do all like minimally and non-invasive procedures. Uh, versus when I was in plastics, I was doing like really large cases like body lifts, reconstructive, um, breast surgery, following cancer diagnoses um, and mastectomies, thigh lifts. I mean, big, big surgeries, right? Yeah. Major weight loss of over like people have lost 300 pounds and re-putting them back together again. Um, and I will say this, when I was, um, a recruiter was placing me out in different areas. And when I looked up the statistics on San Diego, I said, oh my God, this is like the fifth skinniest or fittest uh, like state in the United States. And I thought, oh my gosh, like do these people even need body surgeries like liposuction? Like does that, do they even need that? Out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will say the average BMI of my patients coming from the South to SoCal has been a little bit different, but yes, they still do lipo. Yes, they still need those things, but it is kind of a little bit of a different subset of patients. So. Is it like what you would call like mini lipo? Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I did a lot of, um, you know, minimally invasive liposuction and fat grafting, you know, BBLs, body contouring procedures in Atlanta. And I do still a lot of those out here as well, but really kind of specializing in rapid recovery and minimal downtime. Time. So usually under like an oral anesthesia or sedation. And uh, so they don't have to be induced into general anesthesia given a paralytic and all that jazz. Um, and so, yes, definitely more emphasis on the minimally invasive. Nice, nice. Now I see you're like an expert at body contouring, which is super interesting. Um, <laughs> it is. So what is the difference? Like, what would you suggest for a patient? It's like, I want to decide between body, body contouring, like an M scalp or a cool sculpting or surgery. So I do this every day. Um, and my biggest thing that I let, uh, dictate whatever procedure patients have, and this is across the board, whether they're wanting, uh, we're talking cool sculpting versus lipo is uh, based off of their expectations. So I tell patients mm. all the time, I want to be able to see you through your own eyes. It literally doesn't matter what I see, what Jonathan sees, what anybody else sees, it really matters what you see. So I take some time to make sure that we talk about the things that bother them, the things they like, uh, things that they may wanna kind of tweak a little bit. And then we talk about where they wanna go. You know, if I have a patient coming in for a body procedure who really needs a tummy tuck, and once cool sculpting, but they say, I really want this skin fold all the way gone. Then I, I sit down with them and that's really our main driver of what's gonna choose their procedure. And just, I even have patients, I mean, all the time that they come in and they, I, I may even be a little bit questioning and tell them, well, that's something that's not possible unless you get a tummy tuck and we don't perform those here. So I will refer my patients, which I know most people probably think sounds crazy. I refer my patients to a plastic surgeon. I talk to them about tummy mm. tucks. Of course, I've done a, 
if you can cut it, tuck it, suck it, lift it, stuff it, I've done it. And I've done a lot of them and I give them some guidance with that, but there obviously are some small variations and I will send them to actually maybe one of the other practices I interviewed with down here before I found my home uh, at Noack Aesthetics. And then I send them to them and they're like, wait, are you, I want to book surgery. Why are you sending me someplace else? I go, because I want you to make a really confident decision, whatever that choice is. You know, I want you to be educated about all your possible options. And if you come back to me and say, you know what? No, I, I, I do want to do lipo. I'm okay if I have a little bit of skin laxity there or, or the equivalent, you know, we talk about lipo versus cool sculpting. Um, yeah. Then that's what I really let decide, you know, because cool sculpting works and works tremendously well. All of these minimally or non-invasive procedures work. It's about us. The clinician's job is really not, a, not only to perform a safe and great procedure for the patient, but you know, to make sure that their expectations are aligned. And I think that that sometimes is where if people are unhappy after they have a procedure, I can guarantee you one of two things has happened. It's either been A, the right procedure wasn't done or wasn't done well. And I always tell patients, but I'm doing it. You don't have to worry about that. And or two, the expectations were properly set to mm -hmm. say, well, this is, you know, you may get 20% or so reduction with cool sculpting or double that at least with lipo. And then X amount with a tummy tuck and it's up to us to kind of set them with that. And it means we have to be a little bit more heavy handed with education up front, which is why my consults always take 10 minutes longer than my counterparts. Nice, nice. And that, that makes sense. That's what makes a lot of sense. Expectations from the beginning. So the patient knows what the outcome will be. Right. Great, great, great. So one of the things I, cause a lot of people I've come in contact to, a lot of providers, they always say either cool sculpting is really great or they don't use it at all for their patients. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, have you heard about the model, uh, Lisa Evangelista, when she got the cool sculpting? Um, oh, I'm gonna stop, you're putting me on the spot. I didn't know oh, you. No, 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 no. Person, what is that? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, she, <laughs> she's a model, uh, cause I just thought about it when we were talking about cool sculpting. She's a model, she got cool sculpting and it actually did yeah. the, uh, the reverse reaction. Oh, that, okay, so it yes. It gave yes. me like a ball. Yeah, ball it is joint. very, very rare. Um, I have had in my career maybe two patients that this has happened to. Yeah. So you actually get a, um, a hypertrophy or an exaggeration or growth of the fat cells. It is very, very rare. It that's is like, that's like saying, you know, um, they you went to the hospital and they ended up amputating the wrong leg. <laughs> it happens, uh, but it's very, very rare. Gotcha. Um, but, and that's another thing that I tell patients too. I never create or have any of my nurses create a problem that we can't fix uh, because we do lipo and a lot of body contouring. Uh, if for some reason that were to happen, guess what? I could take care of you and I'm going to take mm -hmm. care of it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's most important for patients to know. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't, and there are no guarantees in this world, period, not yeah. just in the aesthetic space. I cannot guarantee you that your result is going to be similar to this patient's. Like if we're talking cool sculpting or old therapy, you know, I also show a, right, a wide range of before and after photos. This patient responded excellently, but I usually actually show patients that maybe didn't respond as prominently. Yeah. So that again, I like to under promise and over deliver. So most people will like show their, oh, most amazing, da -da -da, you know, before and after. Whereas I'm like, okay, so this one didn't respond as well. Or this is possible, look, she has a little bit of bruising or X, Y, or Z, whatever procedure. Um, but I always tell them that no matter what happens, um, guarantees or not, that we're going to take care of you. Um, and if, you know, all therapy for skin tightening didn't work for you, guess what? I also have Thermage. I also have Batona. I also have multitude of other lasers, uh, threads and fillers and all these other things that we can take care of. Um, I hate this saying, but we're kind of a one-stop shop. Everything, I mean from hair restoration all the way down to, you know, Anka Nikia taking care of some of that derms, taking care of like toenails, literally from head to toe. Wow, so. wow. That's really amazing. And I'm sure you got a lot of different exposure from all different types of aesthetics um, from a while, a while range. So take us back to the beginning. Oh, gosh. Um, how did you, how did you get started in this industry? Because you know you came from a plastics background. So and aesthetics is only what, twenty years old. What made you want to get into such a newer industry? So I actually get asked this question a lot, and I, from my answer, 
I'm going to try to spice that up because I think it's not very interesting. Um, so when I was in my medical training, I yeah. have been, I knew I knew I wanted to do surgery. Uh, when I uh, was accepted my PA program, my physician assistant program uh, in Georgia, Mercer University, go Bears! Whew. And um, I had always known that for sure. And my program was very surgery heavy, which was intentional on my part. And I, we actually had a, our medical board had three plastic, no, correction, two plastic surgeons and a plastic surgery PA on it. And when I was like, in the very beginning, you're getting set up with your advisor and all that. And she told me that I was going to go into plastic surgery. And if you know me, if you want to make sure I don't do something, tell me that I'm going to do it because I just was like, you don't know me. I'm not going to go into plastic surgery, plastic surgery, because I have this really inaccurate uh, perception that plastics wasn't real medicine. And I had intended, and I did actually all my additional training in pediatric cardiothoracic surgery. Mm. And I thought that was what I was going to do. That's what I spent all of my electives doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we ended up losing 12 kids in like a six week period, coding them, pumping their chest, having them pass away. Some of them in front of the parents during a code, um, losing them in surgery. And it was hard. And the only bright side of that was, uh, it did really emotionally affect me, which meant I still had like some remnant of a soul in my you know, carcass of a body through my medical training, being so exhausted and like emo emotionally blunted, it was pretty devastating, you know, not in the moment because you're obviously taking care of this child and running a code and you're fully invested. But after when you get home and it kind of digests, you're like, Ooh, heavy. And, uh, I think from there, I kind of knew myself and that segued me to actually pediatric plastics. Uh, mm -hmm. That was, you know, some of the, um, it, there was a little bit of overlap there at the pediatric hospital that I was at. And I hate telling this story. This part is the worst. I interviewed for that practice for five weeks and I did not get the job. I know, pause for drama. I had never not gotten something or not gotten accepted to anywhere ever. And after the shock and utter devastation set in, they had said that they wanted somebody with more experience and I was fresh. And the HR lady actually called me like almost in tears. And to make matters a little bit better, she did call me for like every year for the next three years saying that they regretted their decision and seeing if I wanted to come work for them. But I had not because I, from pediatric plastics that I was like now dead set. I was like, well, I'm gonna get a job with plastics. And I applied for this job and it was in adult plastics and reconstructive oh. surgery. Um, and I went in and I interviewed, I tell you what, a lot, like three times. I waited in the parking lot for the medical director when they told me he was going to be coming back to the office. And I was like, today? Okay, cool. I got on a board review all day. I guess I'll just wait in the parking lot like a total creep till he comes there. I'm going to learn everything about him while I'm on my phone and then just quarter him in the parking lot and introduce myself, which I did. And I ended up getting a job in plastics. And I told them I was a new grad. You'll have to tell me everything, but you only have to tell me once and I won't have bad habits. And I will listen to whatever you say, because I don't know no better. <laughs> and so you, I'll be your kind of clay, your molding piece. And he just says he finally agreed to hire me because I like filibustered my way in. I didn't really give him another choice. <laughs> and um, yeah, so then I got into adult plastics and then I was completely set in my place. It is, it is actually true medicine. I, I, I cannot tell you how many things I diagnosed from the jump that they didn't know they had or they wanted to really have their surgery and they didn't want to tell me that they had X, Y, and Z. And then I had to end up finding it on blood work or managing all these other things. And of course I fell in love with it. Um, it is literally the perfect blend. And I now understand why my very first attending told me that's what I was going to do because it's the perfect blend. It blends long-term patient follow-up and retention like a family practice. So it's really relationship-based. 
um, which is why my trauma attending told me I didn't have the personality for trauma. And I was like, mm. excuse me, I could do that. And he was like, no, I mean that in a good way. Like your personality would be wasted on this. Like you're gonna save them and then they go on their way and it's no follow up. Um, it's procedure heavy because I need to stay busy, uh, keeping my hands busy. Uh, it is, um, it's also very artistic. And I grew up uh, painting, drawing. I used to sell some of my artwork in college to make a little extra money on the wow. side. Um, and so it kind of blended all of these things, long-term patient follow-up and retention, being very procedure heavy, very artistic and creative and problem solving. Um, and I have healthy patients that want to be there that are highly motivated. It's like, I better stop talking about it. Like it's so awesome because it is. And I don't want everybody to know I'm gunning for my job. It's horrible. You shouldn't do it. It's like the worst ever. No, definitely. Definitely. I could definitely understand that. But that's a that's a really good story. Why do you think there's, I wanted to dig deeper into that. Why do you think there's that stigmatism around plastics? Well, I can say from my standpoint, most, I mean, honestly, whenever there is a, a stigmatism or um, a stereotype, it's usually, yeah. I think, obviously stems out of misinformation or being uneducated about it fully, yeah. uh, making snap judgments off of very limited exposures or observations that you may see. But I think for me personally, um, I had actually um, had exposures to plastic surgery. I mean, that was my um, program. And when I was told that in the beginning, I think I went into medicine thinking that, uh, I don't know that I didn't appreciate how life-changing you can be in any type of situation, no matter if you are on a medical mission in Haiti <clears throat> doing medical relief work or South Africa. I moved there for a summer in college. I thought maybe you had to be kind of doing those kinds of things only to make an impact. And obviously I learned very quickly through my medical training, that's not the case at all. Uh, I have patients who regularly, honestly, sometimes I think that some of the experiences that I have with my patients on a daily basis, not only of course are a blessing, but the transformation of seeing, I mean, people's marriages being saved, um, people getting over depression. I'm not saying that this solves those things, but there is a high correlation to when you look good and you feel good, you put the best you out there, then you get the best people, the best versions of those people back to you. And it is this cycle. I mean, I can't, yesterday I had a patient in my chair. Um, she flew in for me to do her lipo and she was doing one of her post-op visits. And she said that she couldn't wait to be intimate with her husband again, because she hasn't gotten undressed with him with the lights on in over 15 years. Mm. and she said her husband cannot wait and they're planning this date night and doing all I mean those are big tangible things yeah. and I I didn't maybe give it that much respect I think that people just kind of look at it just kind of very topically and I think it's easy right it's the easy thing to stereotypically say oh plastics yeah how vain how vapid but you literally, when anybody says that, I'm like, you can't tell me that if you don't have yourself put together you know, to walk into a meeting and give your best self that you're going to perform the exact same way, feeling your best or being sincerely and devastatingly, you know, self-conscious about something or not liking something or knowing, feeling like you want to fix or tweak something. And of course, we always say these things within, you know, reason. Um, not every patient walks into our office like that episode of Botched, okay? That's the far exception to the rule. And I think that when people really think about that from their personal perspective, I think they realize how, I mean, transformational internally as well as externally. I just, I'm sorry, I'm going through like all of my patients from this week of like a patient, I saw her three months ago from her Botox. She lost 67 pounds since I saw her last. Another one of my patients, he's gotten on a regimen, he's lost 34 pounds. I, this week was like weight loss week, I swear. As so many of my patients, wow. I'm so proud of them and like getting to see their light, like beam out of them and they're living their best life. I'm like, hey, let that rub off on me a little bit. Come on, give me some of that juice, okay? Yeah, no, I can definitely understand. And, and that is true. When you look good, you feel good, you put that energy out there, people receive that. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. 
can we talk about a little bit now you got the job in plastics right mm -hmm. and that was huge but I think the biggest part of that, what you told me was the hustling that you put in to get that oh, job. <laughs> how big, how important is it that to hustle in the beginning of your career to really get there? Like you're speaking from the like template on my soul, hustling to get my first job. I'm glad that you even recognize that because I gave you the very much diluted watered down version. I literally, yeah. I went there, I gave them, I had a full booklet on me, my favorite topic. I don't want to brag, but I am the world's leading expert on me, studying myself the longest. So I thought, well, hey, here's my opportunity to tell them about myself. And I took every certificate I got in my eight, you know, my uh, CPR certification, my BLS, my ACLS, my um, every review I'd gotten from any preceptor or attending, all of my um, grading systems, my thesis, my CV, of course. I mean, anything that was pertinent or relevant. I put and I bound it in like a book about me. Um, and it, I brought that and I left, I made multiples of them to go on my interviews and leave that book with them. And um, when I was there interviewing, she said, I think the manager realized that I was not a new graduate. I had never said I wasn't, but I yeah. think when I sent her all these materials and whatnot, she just kind of assumed. And when she had told me that, I may have to come back a different day. I had asked because I was in my board's review. I had not even graduated yet. And wow. attendance is mandatory in school. You literally, they do not let you out for like funerals. Okay. Like it's, you have to be there. And I, so I had really like finagled my way into being able to leave to do this interview. And I took the whole day off because I was planning on getting in there and being like, all right, let's do this now. Let's come on. I got the time. And when she said that, no, she'd have to talk with them because they did not want a new graduate. And essentially kind of terminating my interview uh, and then saying like writing it off and being like, well, I'll talk to the medical director about it. Okay. Um, he's not even here right now though. So I can't really do anything about it. And, but he's coming in later on today. So I was like, okay, when? And she said, told me like in a couple hours, I was like, okay, well, I ain't got nothing but time to burn. So I went to the parking lot and I waited, like I said, and then I went up to him, <laughs> introduced myself and he asked me who I was. And I said, I'm, I was Yarbrough at the time, Jennifer Yarbrough, and I'm going to be your new PA. And he was like, oh, excuse me. I said, oh, yes, I, I just interviewed this morning as I'm like following him into the building. And he's like, OK, yeah, well, I'll talk to her about it. I got to get some lunch. And I was like, oh, my gosh, thank you. I'm starving. And I just like follow him into the building. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And and we went through interviews and I literally I filibustered my way. They really didn't want to hire me. I went back for three different interviews. And I then, uh, I, I, I rapped at the very end. I was like, look, if you're gonna have, like, you need somebody here, give me a chance. And if anything else fails, say everything else. You, I'm not confident, all of your biggest fears come true. Uh, Cause I like to play a little game called, and then what? And people say like, oh, well then this will happen. And I go, and then what? And then what? So, okay, so then I'm not good and confident. I know they don't have to worry about that. But I go, and then what? Well, then, okay, then you can let me go. And that's fine. It, you know, we both learned something. I said, but at least I will make sure that I make it fun. And he goes, mm -hmm. excuse me? And I go, yeah, well, like, I'll wrap in the OR for you. And he was like, what? And this had started when I was doing spine surge, like 12 hour cases. And he was like, you just need something. So I just like, he was like, you don't wrap. And I said, oh, yes, I do. And then he said, okay, we'll do it now. And then I found the need to like stand up slowly. And then I just like dropped some bars and then I like curtsied at the end. I have no idea why I did that. And then I sat down <laughs> and, uh, but it was like that really loud chair, you know, like when you're wheeling it in and it's like, so silent, like, and I was like, okay, and I'm done. And he was like, all right, start Monday. Are you serious? Uh -huh. And when I started it, I thought, oh, it'll be easy. You're getting like your login and your laptop and all that stuff for your first day, right? Uh, no, I had actually, I told him he said start Monday and I said, actually, I'm going, I'm going to be taking my boards and I can't like start technically. And we worked out the date to start and I had to get married and go on my honeymoon. I had a lot of things that were going on at that time. Yeah. And he said for me to start, he named a day and I started on that day thinking it was going to be really chill. And then I go in and 
it is just me and him in the practice for practitioners. I had yep. two nurses, a front office staff. We were really small. We grew it to over 30 staff by the time I left. But let me tell you this. He, he started that day. Or I started that day with an expectation, which I probably shouldn't have had. Yep. But I thought, oh, it's going to be chill. Because when you're in school and you're in training, you always you are like, you go in knowing you're the understudy, you know, you have someone to look to. I rolled up in that practice. I had a full day of patients. I had consults. I didn't even know how to log into the computers there. And he was out of the country. Yes. He was in Nigeria. We had an international practice and I'm freaking out because I get emergency orders from the hospitals calling me all this stuff. I didn't know how to write. I was like, how do I write a prescription? What do I need? I'm trying to figure this out. Nobody's helping me. And he did that on purpose because he didn't think I was going to last. And they had done this mm -hmm. set up and he had his other, you know, uh, colleague who would take call and things like that. And they had it all managed, but I had no, no idea of that. So I was trying to figure it out with no help. And I kind of then went to my manager. I said, Hey, I just want to double check something with him. She said, okay, well, you can call him, but it's about 10 PM there. So he's sleeping. And I'll just say, if you call him, he hates being woken up. So good luck. And I said, okay, let me try to figure this out. Call my friend. Hey, how do you do this? And he's like, ask the other PA in your practice. I was like, there isn't one. And then he was like, ask the other doc in your practice. I was like, yeah, he's gone. And he's like, who do you have else to ask? I was like, you, you are the only person I have to ask. And I, but I figured it out. I hustled. I booked two of my consults that day. Wow. And you know, it was really trial by fire. I train yeah. my precept now. And um, when I hear uh, something that I hear, I don't want to say consistently, like with every person, but there's definitely a tone shift. I kind of my uh, more old school, I guess, for me of like, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity. Like, let me get in here and just figure this out. And I want to work really hard. I'm, I'm not going to look to somebody and say, oh, I don't know how to do it or something like that. And of course, I'm not talking about being a cowboy and doing things beyond your, your safety parameters or endangering a patient at all, but about like just getting in and trying to figure it out before you immediately go and ask a question. You know what I mean? And when I precept and train and everything now, I just constantly hear like, oh, yeah, I don't really know how to do that. Or I haven't done one of those before. Or, you know, for me, I was a gunner and I am a gunner. I want to, if you tell me, I don't know if I don't know how to do something, I want to watch you do it. I want to watch how he does it and she does it. I want to figure out five different ways to do it. I want to do it the best out of all those ways. Then I want to develop my own way to do it that's even better than that way. And then I want to teach other people how to do it. Like I want, I'm like hungry, hungry. And it can be an intensity for some people. I do understand that not everybody's like that. Some people are like, okay, a little more, whenever I get to it, but that's not me. Obviously, because I'm talking to you like this on my computer. And, um, I definitely sense that there's a shift in that, especially in the aesthetic space. People think it like looks so sexy on Instagram and it looks like it's very easy and there's just a before and after. Um, but if you really know what you're doing, you can understand, I mean, the complexities of the things we do. A patient asked me yesterday, she, actually while I was in surgery, she was my surgery patient, she was talking to me and she was like, can things like actually go wrong when you get Botox? Granted, she she gets Botox with me. I yeah. said, of course they can. Do you remember when I reviewed those with you? She goes, yeah, but do those actually happen? And I said, most definitely. And I went through and explained them to her and she was like, oh, and granted she was medicated, okay? So she's like, oh no. And then she was like a very dramatic response. And I literally thought I wish I'd recorded that because I honestly think that if most people knew Kind of the depth and complexities of the things that we do they have that same reaction <laughs> without medication on it like whoa crazy and you have to have you know a hunger to hold yourself to a super high standard on what you do um and because nobody's going to be coming around and you know making sure unfortunately a lot of times so I don't know how that ties into when I apologize, but that was obviously a long soapbox that I just got on. And I appreciate letting me stand on it for so long. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries at all. I think which the question was kind of like, what, how did you like, um, sorry. <laughs> hustle, why was the hustle so important? Yes, yes, why, how did you, why was the hustle so important? And you explained that very well. Like, 
And I, I'm a big believer in it also. When a provider is interviewing, getting into this industry new, you, sometimes you have to take a, maybe a lower paid opportunity or sometimes you have to take an opportunity <laughs> that might not be as good, but you have to just break in there and then get to the next Sweat level. equity. Sweat equity. That's, yes, thank you. That's like a very, very good point. I will say this. I was practicing interviewing with my husband beforehand. Yeah. And he was like, all right, we're going to get to the numbers part, okay? So... And I'm, I'm going to give you this anecdote because I literally, I, it embodies who I am as a person. And, and honestly, not, I don't think a lot of people have this mentality and maybe they shouldn't, but yeah. he was like, okay, so I'm going to pretend like I'm going to give you an offer. And then you tell me what you think. Okay. I'm going to ask you how much you want to get paid. And I was like, okay, okay. Yeah. Sitting down. And so he's like, okay, Jennifer, how much were you expecting to get compensated for in this position? And I said, well, sir. I honestly, you know what? I have been really working for so long and I have been paying to go and get trained and work so hard. I mean, when you're in training, people forget you're paying them. So much money. You're not, you're also, you're not working or making money. You're paying them a ton of money for you to be worked 80 hours a week on call all the time. Right? So I said, honestly, I'm just so happy to not be paying anybody to work anymore. I'd probably be happy just working for free. And my husband was like, oh my God, no, 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 no. Do not say that. Do not say that at all. Are you crazy? And I was like, what? It's true. And he was like, okay, we're going to try this again. Never have those words come out of your mouth. So um, I then, when I was actually in my negotiation for my contract, you know, he had worked with me and knowing what you're worth is a very important thing. Not being taken advantage of is also a very important thing. However, you're asking them to trust you that you are going to yield for them and work so hard for them. Mm -hmm. And not you also have to, you know, that they're asking you to trust them that they're going to compensate you fairly based off of their practice that they know. And so what I ended up doing is I took obviously lower than I had anticipated. I think that usually both parties walk away slightly a little bit unhappy. And that's usually how, you know, a negotiation went well. Yeah. And then what I worked in though was, okay, after 90 days, then I want a reevaluation based off of what you see from me, because I do not, I do not shy away from that. My proof is in the pudding and, you know, grab a spoon because you're, you are going, A, it's going to be life-changing and B, you probably never seen the hustle like I have. I know for a fact, I may not be, you know, the um, longest practicing, the um, you know, the nicest, most charismatic, the smartest or whatnot, but I know hands down, I'm going to be the thirstiest. I'm going to be the mm -hmm. hardest worker. And I think that, um, especially in this industry, uh, because I think it looks very accessible through mm -hmm. Instagram and things like, let's just say, you know, I don't see like a ton of colonoscopies being put on, you know, or, you know, plural synthesis or other, you know, subspecialties procedures that they do on Instagram as much, right? We live in this aesthetic world and you have to pay for that somehow. Early in your career is when I recommend doing it because all I'm saying is now that I'm old, I I don't think I would approach doing 80 hours a week on call at five hospitals uh, all the time I, with quite as much gusto as I do now. And I, and I definitely do not regret it at all. I tell all of my students that, that I present, my med students, PA students, put the sweat equity in when you get out of school. Bust your butt, because you don't know any different anyway. You've been doing that already. You know, put your time in to establish yourself so that you can reap the benefits of, you know, your, your time off you get to choose. I didn't take time off on Christmas for my first six years of practice because that was oh. such a busy time for us. I would celebrate Christmas the beginning of January when it goes through a little lull. And, and I was just thankful to be able to get the time. You know, there has to be a gratitude of reciprocity uh, because you are, you wanna be elite and, but you have to show people that because everybody can say it in an interview. You know what I mean? And I think that that's something that I don't see as much, but I tell everyone to do it. Don't shy away from it. Put your head down, you know, take the, take the licks and take them to heart because they're teaching you. 
and they're training you. And some of my most valuable lessons that I still pass on were in those couple of very beginning formidable years. And, and I got, you know, double the experience in half the time. It was a real bargain. If you think about it, 80 hours a week, Hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm doubling up here. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. What are some of those lessons that you learned that you could share? My numero uno lesson. Let's see. Okay. So do you, let me take you back. There we are in the OR. Okay. Do you feel like you're in there? Yes. Right, your hands are feral. You've got your gown, glove, everything on. And we're doing a breast augmentation mastopexy. So I am sewing up, I'm tacking uh, the nipple back together. I'm oh, sorry, I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, go ahead. The areolar complex. And um, I think it was, it was late. We'd been called in um, for another case. So this one had bumped, so it was really late. And I had drinking coffee um, right beforehand, like a lot of it, because yeah. it was going on a long time. And uh, because the emergency case got bumped before it. And then I am in there and we're operating and it's also freezing and I just had coffee and I'm shaking a little bit. And this was in the more towards the very beginning of my career. And the surgeon I was with had actually told like the scrub techs and things at the hospital. We had our own surgery center as well, but this case we were doing at the hospital. He had told them to be really rough on me and to like pull the wrong stuff on my car and to, you know, give me a hard time. If I ask for a you know, utensil for them to give me the wrong one for me to be able to be really diligent and know that everything that happens in that OR is ultimately my responsibility. It doesn't matter, you know, if they handed me the wrong one or something like I need to make sure that everything is taken care of. And um, so the scrub tech was riding me and hard. And she was making fun of me and through the whole case. So now at this point in the case, and then I, I noticed I have this like slight tremor from the caffeine and probably a little bit of exhaustion too. And this is why I do not drink coffee anymore. I don't drink coffee at all. Um, like if you're going to Starbucks for something delicious, I will, I'll like give you a drink order, but it's not like my herb yeah. um, But So I start to make fun of myself before she does at this point. And I started to be like, oh my God, look at me. Um, and this was probably not the most sensitive uh, joke to make either. I was like, look at me, look at my tremor. And because it was late in the day, I was like, what do I have? Like Parkinson's and my sundowning? Oh my God, like, look at this. Like, oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous. Does anybody see this? Yeah. And literally he, um, he looked at me in the eyes and I could tell he was livid. And he told me to put my instruments down on the field immediately. And I often use humor for levity. Uh, it is my go-to. And so I was like, oh, somebody in trouble. And then he literally like, he takes my arm because I put my, I was still putting them down there, not stupid. And he takes my forearm and he grabs me and he pulls me like this over the patient. He said, you listen to me and you listen to me good. You are, need, you need to do everything in your power to set yourself up for success. Do you see all these people in this room? They are just like everyone else in this world and they're gonna do a good enough job of making fun of you and putting you down and underestimating you better than anybody else. And they're gonna do that enough for you. You are the last person that needs to be doing that in self-sabotaging. It's not funny. It's not cute to use humor to put yourself down. You need to identify your flaws, keep them inside, work on them. And he said, I don't want you to lose your personality, but you don't ever, ever talk about yourself in that way, ever. And I, you know, he was very harsh with me with that. And I'm so glad he was because I learned something super valuable that it is true. The whole world is going to do a really good job at putting you down. You don't need to give yeah. them any help. They've already got enough ammo on their own. Okay. So you need to be, if you're not going to support and endorse yourself, who is? How on earth would you ever expect a patient to trust you? Is it saying you're perfect? No, but you don't need to give anybody any help because they got it covered as I'm sure everybody can be aware of. And I tell that too, to my trainees, my staff, if, if I ever hear anybody say, oh my God, I'm, oh, I'm so stupid. No, you're not. 
you just made a mistake in an oversight. And I don't let my patients talk about themselves like that either. I go, nope, not in my chair, not today. You are not putting yourself down. And I think that that's just a really important thing for as you go through life. It doesn't mean to be insensitive to, or not open to you know constructive criticism, but don't you don't need to walk all over yourself. You know what I mean? No, I, I definitely can understand what you mean. That self confidence really, it, like you, like we said before, it brings it out. It translates and gives other people to believe what you're you're putting out there. So uh, no, I definitely can understand that and say that. You probably great. thought it. I should have probably given one that was more about patient care, huh? No, no, that was great. I think because I think people really need that though. You know what I mean? Especially being in this industry, a lot of providers are scared to like work on their own, be in this industry. I get a lot of people that have been in the industry for like three years are scared to do certain procedures, but that confidence that you have. Well, speaking is, to that though, I will say this. Yeah. I actually, the confidence, yes, is important. Yeah. However, if I tell patients, or sorry, I, I tell providers that you should always be a little bit, not scared, but attentive, that same level of alertness, whenever you do any procedure, I don't care how many times you've done it. In fact, the more you do something, the more likely you are to get a complication, mm -hmm. right? We're yeah. talking about averages. So you yeah. should always, it isn't just Botox. It isn't just filler. It isn't just anything. It is always, you need to have that level of care and attention. Like you are a little bit scared. Yeah. Um, and I find, honestly, it's been a little bit scary for me. Sometimes I'm seeing a lot of practitioners going out on their own who should be more scared and not be doing a lot of the things that they are. Uh, I had a patient this week come in. She got nose filler at a house party by an injector. I almost fell out of oh, my chair. Wow. That's I amazing. asked her, did you know if they had dissolving agent there? No. Do you know what they injected? No. When are you going for your follow-up? No, they don't have one. How do you, I mean, I'm not, this is obviously an exaggerated point. Yeah. But it's happening a lot and a lot more frequently. This patient who told me this, she's been invited to three parties like that in the past year. That is an astronomical rate. When I first started practicing concierge med medicine like this, look like, Botox parties and stuff were kind of still a thing, but they really kind of fell out of best practices. I think COVID obviously reignited that a little bit, but honestly, I respect a clinician 50 times more when they say, I actually don't feel comfortable. I get patients all the time from a practice. They don't feel comfortable injecting tear troughs. I respect them so much. I send every other patient that they could help with there, there all the time because they know themselves and they know their boundaries and what they're comfortable doing. And I think that takes so much more gumption to say, hey, and draw a line there than it and with, by offering patients the best and safest procedure because you're gonna get them to somebody who really does know what they're doing. So I think that there is definitely a fear and the confidence I like to kind of separate out because being scared or intimidated by a procedure you can be still very confident as a provider. And I think you actually have to have that confidence to be able to identify that, that little mm. bit of fear during the procedure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. People who don't understand what's going on or don't have that confidence probably think, well, oh, I'd give it a shot. Hey, why not? Um, so I think they're kind of mutually exclusive, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about the trends in the industry. Obviously, you've been in the trend industry. You go to a lot of different things. What trends are you seeing right now that are hot or that you like? Okay, this is this has like been my discussion point because I've been having to have this conversation a lot with patients lately. So the aesthetic industry has been booming, of course, and there's a lot of different things going on. But I want to talk more about trends. What trends are you seeing in the industry that are hot that you're using right now that, you know, tell us a little bit about that. So hot right now, the trends. Okay, so I have been talking to my patients a lot about this procedure for the past several months. Um, and it's threads, thread lifts, so hot yeah. right now, brand new. And they're not, 
new at all. We've been doing them since the 90s. And I think that they've just gotten like a resurgence or something with on social probably the last one to two years. Uh, and thread lifts have been around for a long time. I've personally been doing them since I think like 2016. And however, they are, I think, getting a really big resurgence on social because it's like the perfect click, the perfect clickbait. Essentially, you see a procedure, there's like lots of crazy things hanging out of a person's face. So you're like, oh, what's this? Um, when you do the procedure, you see that immediate result. So a before and after or a video right there, you know, in real time. And also, I think the desire for younger people to be getting procedures done who maybe don't need a lot of filler uh, because they're not really volume deficient. So it's another rejuvenative procedure that is really picking up with younger uh, patients. You know, things like a brow lift or lip flip or, you know, different things like that. And it's really interesting because I always say this in our space that it's very rare that we have a brand new procedure. Almost always it's been, it's a procedure that's been around for a long time, slightly modified, just repackaged and then put out there. They're like, hey, remember me? If you do, you're old. If you don't, hey, this is brand new. And uh, threads are definitely kind of really on fire and on terms of traction on social and things like that, I think. And a lot of patients coming in asking me about them. Do we do them? What are they for? And I actually really like threads. It's just that I think that they're not, uh, pe they're presented as another like, oh, all you have to do are threads. And it's like, no, we still have to do our Botox for neuromodulator our fillers where we're volume deficient, our skin resurfacing and threads are not a one and done thing. We need to, to keep up with them. You know, I do a, a thread procedure insta lifts and that has probably one of the most longevities, one to two years, but we also do PDO threads, very small threads. You need to redo those every three to six months, but nobody sees that part of it. They're just like, oh, wow, threads, this awesome thing. So I try to be kind of really heavy handed on my education up front with them about it because I do love them and they offer an uh, they are, they offer and can satiate like a need of a brow lift. You can only do so much lifting with Botox and skin tightening. Being able to place something into mechanically redrape tissue is something that's really, it's not a novel idea, but it's kind of innovative and ingenious. It makes sense, I think, to a lot of people. You know, I think sometimes when we talk about energy treatments or like cool sculpting or something, patients are like, so wait, how does this work? Like some voodoo witchcraft magic, like just waves over and then but I think they can really conceptually uh, understand threads. I am placing a like suture-like material there, lifting, redraping. So I think it resonates a lot with patients. And I think that also is contributing to its growing trend, which is honestly really good for patients because the increased demand means increased um, productivity by the companies making them better products, um, better procedures, better techniques and better cost eventually too. So I think that that's probably so hot right now, threads. And, but honestly, I think just about anything can. And I obviously know that on my social, I get a different subset of recommendations. So maybe that's just Siri listening to me right now, talking to you about threads. So they're gonna fill my feed with it too. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's what I'd say. Nice. Does, does patients come in to ask for the GT Hadi Brown? Oh, maybe not. They, uh, <laughs> they, I, I've gotten, honestly, I get more of what they don't want to look like usually by specific name reference. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the, and the only celebrity that I actually reference in my like explanations of things. And I literally, if you would have told me that in my medical career, I would be utilizing Kim Kardashian and an Instagram post as a regular reference wow. to explain what microneedling or vampire facials are. I'd have, I'd have called you a liar. I would have <laughs> not thought that, but I will go through the most lengthy explanation, show them videos and photos. And then all of a sudden at the end they go, oh, do you mean it's that thing Kim Kardashian did when she had this stuff on her face? And I'm like, 
yeah, you know what? Yeah, it is. I should have just, why don't you just start with that? I'm like, okay. So you should get microneedling because Kim K does it. I that guess. is so interesting. So interesting. San Diego, California, California. Yes. <laughs> nice, nice. So I was reading some of your reviews on your patients. I'll be sure to speak about you and things like that. <laughs> Where? Oh God. Where? <laughs> and one of the things I saw that was interesting is like a lot of patients come from like 500 miles, all these crazy miles away to come see you. How did you get that, build that with them? Or how did you, let's talk about that. So people have started to ask me this a lot lately and I need to curtail a better response because it was not intentional. In fact, I think I tried to obstruct it quite a bit. Mm. I obviously I moved out here to San Diego to join my current practice. So I had, and I honestly, my previous practice, there was a lot of different things that kind of happened and culminated. My husband's job shifted. And so we just kind of came to this scene essentially in our lives. And so I grew up in the army, so I've lived everywhere. My husband was born and raised out here in San Diego. And so we said, okay, well, let's kind of be open to moving. And I actually interviewed in Denver. I had four or five practices there, about five here in San Diego. I even applied, I interviewed for one in Hawaii. Oh. But then I looked at the cost of living in Hawaii and I was like, ooh, maybe not. So, so uh, yeah, we kind of had everything open. Then when I moved out here, even though I gave my previous practice and all my patients there like something silly, like six months notice of telling them that I was leaving and all these things and it was the worst. I had to like go in every day and like break up with like 30 plus people over and over and over again. Because when my girls on the phone started telling my patients there that I was leaving, it only happened twice because both patients got enraged that they were hearing it from somebody else. One of them drove up to the practice and gave the head surgeon like a piece of her mind. and was oh, like, you can't ever let her leave, are you kidding? And, my, and he was like, I, my hands are tied, you know, her husband's job and all this other stuff. So I had to end up doing it over and over and over again. And so maybe that played into it a little bit. So, but I didn't even know where I was going at that point. I was like, I don't know. I may go to Denver. I may go to San Diego. They want me to try LA. So I didn't even know, but I just was telling them, but I'm actually really glad I did that. Cause I am really trying to be, I just am really bonded to my patients. Honestly, I, I love them each individually so very much. And we've been through a lot of things together. So taking the time, I think with that, for them to know where I was going was helpful eventually, or, you know, then they started kind of being aware that I wasn't going to be there. I, they didn't just show up for an appointment one day. And so this is actually a side note. I mean, if you are a practitioner and you are thinking of maybe changing up where you're currently working, maybe you're at an established practice and you want to do something on your own or something, I'm kind of putting this together right now as I'm talking to you about it. I think a lot of people try to keep that really hush hush that they might be doing other things or moving. And I honestly think if you're a professional and can, I mean, handle it professionally and let them know so that of course you can never like poach patients or anything like that, but you're able to really kind of depart from that practice with a sense of finality or closure, which you definitely deserve if you've been, you know, taking care of patients and practicing there for any significant amount of time. <coughs> So I think that, that, and that can also allow you to hopefully have success at other endeavors. You know, I had a strict policy in my contract that, and I didn't want to at all. I didn't connect. I didn't reach out to any patients aside from those interactions in there. And I didn't even really have an Instagram. I know I had it, but like, I never posted on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't like, I mean, we were still using Facebook. Hey, <laughs> it was so uncool. And maybe that had to do with it, but I've had a lot of patients, a lot of my patients fly out from Georgia still to come see me. Whoa. And sometimes they do it literally just for like their Botox, which I tell them they're just crazy. And they do it and they, but they come out, fly out for their appointment, a little filler, maybe Botox, and they turn right back around and fly back. 
And then I have also though a lot of new patients that come in that weren't my patients before. And it's from really interesting niches. I have like a little hub up in NorCal and San Francisco and in Texas and Arizona. And I don't know how they have found me. I do know though that I do a lot of virtual medicine and I always have because my previous practice was an international practice. So I would travel to Africa every three months, operate for a week and then come back. So I started doing telemedicine over a decade ago. Uh, so when we didn't have all of these, you know, modalities and EMR system, you know, medical record systems now that really make it to where it's like a given. And that I think really came to light during COVID as well. But uh, during COVID, when people were doing webinars, like, how do you do this like virtual medicine thing? And I was like, do you have an iPhone? Okay. <laughs> and it's, to me, it just seemed so obvious. I was like, okay, well, perfect. And, you know, I was, I do a lot of stuff still virtually, even with patients that are here, because maybe they're busy. We just need to do a follow-up or procedure plan. So I've always kind of thought outside the box like that a little bit, maybe because of that international practice experience. And I connect with them. I think honestly, out of town patients, they're a completely different kind of patient. They know more about your practice and your staff probably does. They know you. They know the last four, your social, who your first boyfriend was, your mother's maiden name. I mean, they know, you know, what your horoscope sign is and what moon is in Gatorade or whatever. I mean, they know everything about you. And I love that. And, you know, it, you have to be really intentional. Also, I do a lot of planning for my patients. We do a lot of procedure planning. So when they do come, I think of everything like a puzzle and I love it. It's like, I know this can all fit. How can we do this? What, what order should we do this in? How can we do this or this or this? And I think that maybe I even get these little hubs because a patient comes, a one-off patient comes and has a great experience. Like my hub in, you know, in Northern California, I'm pretty sure one single patient is responsible for. And she just loved her results. And honestly, she consulted with me years ago and I sent her on a plastic surgery consult to one of my friends up in NorCal. And she was major weight loss. She didn't want to have a tummy tuck. So I, I honestly was really playing it down. I was like, you really need it. Just wait it out. And she said that was the thing that made her, she did consults, I mean, dozens. And she said that was one of the things is that I was one of the only people who told her that she should consider something else instead of saying, oh yeah, step right up and swipe your card and wear And I was just really honest and I treat patients the way, you know, I would want someone to treat me or my, or my family. And she said, you're the only one that said that. And she ended up having her surgery with me. She's done another surgery with me. She looks absolutely fabulous, is living her best life. And guess what? Happy people like to share their results. And that's a word of mouth is so important. Now, you may not think that if you're reading review sites, you're like one negative comment, well, you'll remember everything else. But if they do, and that goes back to what we said in the very beginning, you know, when you look good, you feel good and you want to tell people and you want other people to feel good and join your feel good party. And I think that might have something to do with it, but it was not intentional. And in fact, like I said, I, I think I've obstructed myself in a lot of ways because I really... You know, on Instagram, I used to post a lot more regularly, but I'm so busy with my patients, which is a lovely problem to have, not a problem at all, that I don't, I've gotten really bad at it and I know I'm going to get better. Okay. Don't tell me something. I already, okay. I'm amazing. Amazing. Uh, do you use social media at all? Has that played an impact in your career at all? Or are you more than one of those providers that don't even, it's not really a thing? So, Yes. <laughs> to both. Uh, when I first joined my current practice, like I said, I had an Instagram, but I never used it or posted on it. And they told me I was going to do Instagram. And I was like, no, I'm not. And they're like, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. And yeah. then they told me that three more times. So finally, I was like, fine. They gave me a phone and they're like, literally just record yourself. Okay. We'll take yeah. care of everything else. And it was actually when I had a CO2 laser procedure done. And I was going to vlog, or no, sorry, just make stories. People don't say vlog anymore, right? Uh, anyway, I was going to I was going to document my journey on my phone uh, for patients to be able to understand that recovery process. Because CO2 is definitely a little bit more involved and can actually vary tremendously based off of your post-care and things like that. So 
I was like, okay, that's, I like that. It's education based. It would be a good reference point for patients. When I tell them you'll be a little bit puffy the next morning. Well, now they'll get to know what that looks like a little bit. Right. Yeah. So I just recorded it. I handed the phone and then they did all the individual stories. And then they were like, yeah, so stories are supposed to be like short. <laughs> I was like, all right, good to know. And then I started getting more familiar with it and I started doing it. And, uh, I really, really was, I got a fire in my belly for it to kind of, you know, learn it. This is probably four years ago or so. My practice and like really establishing myself there. And I'm really glad that they pushed me to do it because then I really did begin to appreciate the utility of this. Now, I'm not going to lie. I'm quite possibly one of the most selfish Instagram users. I just post, I cannot tell you the last time I went through a feed. I just do not. <laughs> I go through, try to get to my DMs, my messages, and do a post or story. My post game has oh, I got a little bit, but I'm getting back up. And my work had told me they said, you can do a personal and a professional. And I was like, y'all, y'all give me too much. <laughs> a, I'm not that talented to do two separate. B, I'm not that interesting to have a whole separate one for my personal life. My personal life is essentially my work life. And I combine them. So, uh, and I think honestly, it plays a lot into it. You know, things come up in your personal life and I think it helps patients connect with you too. And I also kind of like going able to look back through my old vacations on there, you know, on stories. And patients love that too, because they feel like you're getting a point of connection with them, even though you may not be seeing them right then, right? And it keeps them present of mind too. So I really like it. I think it's definitely huge. I am not the I wish I could do a lot more. I get tons of ideas. My nurses keep an idea, Jenny's idea book at our nurses station for them to record my award winners. Yeah. And um, maybe when medicine doesn't work, if medicine doesn't work out for me, I can go to that, maybe be on Shark Tank or something. But I think it's it's tremendous. It's only probably going to continue to get bigger and bigger. As much as I hate saying that, it is a huge component of our care. It's what patients are going to to educate themselves. So if you know, if you feel like they're not being educated properly, then Put some material out there that's more accurate, you know? Most of the providers I speak with have a trouble. They'd be like, what about work-life balance as far as like with Instagram or putting too much information out there about yourself and patients knowing too much about you? How do you feel about that? Do you think it's a balance or do you feel like it does and there's no? Huh, interesting. So they don't want people to know them? They, they they feel like they can know them, but then it, like sometimes people know their boyfriend or their husband or this, and it gets too much into their personal life of you did this and that, you know what I mean? So it's like, um, how do you know how much to share versus gotcha. how much to keep back? Well, based off of my follow-up questions, uh, <laughs> I may not know that much because I don't maybe I'm not that interesting. I mean, there's definitely things I try to always stay positive in my life just in general. Yeah. Um, I, but I also have posted things where I was struggling. One was when my sister was deployed in Afghanistan and there was just some crazy stuff going on. And another times have been with my dogs actually when they've gotten really sick or one of my dogs yeah. passed away. Uh, and I've got to say that I don't have never really thought about that. Uh, as I told you before we started, is there anything you don't want me to say? Because I'm pretty, just, I am pretty authentically myself. The same me you get in the room is the same me when I'm out with my staff, with my family, with my friends. I'm very much that way. I've been told that a lot as well. I, what I, I when I say I don't have a filter, I don't mean that I'm like inappropriate or anything. I'm just exactly, what I say is exactly what I mean. A lot of people will say like, well, I didn't know if you meant this when you said that. No, I'm not that good. You're giving me too much credit. I'm not that good to say something and then actually for it to be something else. Yeah. And so I'm just very, very been always very authentic and very open in that way. And I pretty much share everything. My husband does get mad if I am filming and I put him on a story without giving him warning. But Pete, my patients who watch my Instagram love it and they comment on it all the time. Like they will, I get like laughs. They're like, oh my God, he kills me. Oh my God, this is hilarious. And I'm like, they even like call it, he's like, he's literally like just like sleuthing in the back. He's just like, hey, you know, <laughs> and he's like super calm, just like me, you know, yeah. so calm and laid back. Um, and so I've always been really transparent. And honestly, I mean, 
I think, at least in my per personal experience, patients come in and talk to me about that all of the time. I mean, I had a huge knee surgery and two knee surgeries last year from a horrible injury that I had. And I shared that on Instagram. I let my patients know, I'm so sorry, this is where I'm at now. And patients, every time they came in, even if I hadn't told them, they're like, how's your knee? How are you doing? And, you know, I think that that's really important. It humanizes you. You're a person as well. They, they know my husband, uh, know my husband. They know my life. They know I'm close with my family. Um, you know, if I've ever, I mean, this happened a couple of years ago, my dad, he decided to like mow the lawn with a sling blade. I don't know why he has a perfectly good lawnmower and we're not like pioneer people. And he like severed one of his arteries and his leg. It was this huge deal. I had to immediately fly back to the East coast and I had to cancel patients and patients. And I was so worried. I was like, Oh my God, they're going to be so upset. So angry, literally every one of them was told me they were like, please don't even worry about it. Oh my God. I hope that you, your dad's okay. And what somebody just asked me about my dad again yesterday. I think that it helps patients understand that you're a person. And if for some reason, an incident like that comes up, or maybe, um, you might be struggling a little bit, you know, just like how we're in there, to take care of them. And we're observing everything about them. They do the same thing back to us. So it lets them know. And I think appreciate your, where you're at. Do you know what I mean? Now I'm not saying like, you need to every like guy who ghosts you or doesn't text, text you back to put it on there. But I don't know. I've, I've always been really open. Maybe I shouldn't be, maybe after this, you can give me some notes and be like, yeah, these are not hitting that well. Go ahead and take those. Down. No, I think it works. I think, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, but I think sharing your personal life works. Like you said, people come in and like, they want to see you because of who you are. Like the reason, right. Yeah, the reason, like, let's say Kim Kardashian is so big because everybody knows her life. They want to be on that journey with her and they're on the journey with you. And I also think it's because they also don't know her as well. There's like a little bit of an <laughs> enigma factor and they want to see if she's going to like show what's underneath. I don't know, with this whole new like Pete Davidson thing, I think we're going to start to see a little bit more of her personality come through. But I will just say this. I think that in, in this subspecialty of this in the aesthetic space in general there is this kind of mentality of like hush hush I don't want anybody to know my secrets and do it like me and and kind of this like I don't know do you feel like that's the case or am I just making that up no I have several people during these interviews have said the same exact thing so no that's definitely the case and yeah and I think that I only really know that because when I am around people I'm like gather around my children I'll tell you the story when we only had radius you know what I mean like and I'm very open and people will be like ooh they're like sus from the start they're like why what are you doing what what's the what what's your end game here you know what I mean and they tell me they're like what's the catch and I think that when you can be really authentic with yourself I'm very confident in the fact that nobody can do what I do, how I do, like I do, period.